does that stand for? Free body diagram. Stands for a free body diagram. Who can tell me what a free body diagram is? There's a way to remember this. If we abbreviated FBD, a free body diagram, replace the word free with another F word. Well, don't just pick random F words, but with some other relevant F word, then we can remember that a free body diagram is a diagram that shows all of the forces acting on an object. Now, sometimes in a free body diagram, we show other things as well. The mass of the object, the acceleration, the velocity, whatever. We do that simply because we've got to write down givens. Sometimes it's just as easy to write them down as part of our free body diagram as it is to write them down separately. But understand that those things aren't required in our free body diagram. The forces are the only things that are absolutely required on our free body diagram. Let's draw a free body diagram here right now. Let's say that we have an object that has a mass of 100 kilograms. It's being pushed on a horizontal flat surface to the right. It's pushed to the right with a force of 200 newtons. There is a force of air resistance that has a value of 50 newtons and a frictional force of 75 newtons. Take about 30 seconds right now, please, and draw that free body diagram for that situation, and then we'll draw it on the board and see if you got it right. OK, let's draw it here now. We have, uh, what do we got here? We got a 100 kilogram object. We're going to label that 100 kilograms, although if you left that off, that's OK, because that's not really part of our free body diagram. It's just useful sometimes to have the mass written down, right? It's useful to have all our givens written down. And if we can do it as part of our free body diagram, then why not? What else we got? Um, we got a force of 200 newtons to the right. I'm going to call that FA for the applied force, although you could have called it whatever you wanted. FA, FB, F1. Okay, that doesn't matter. makes no difference whatsoever what you call that. Uh, we have a force of air resistance of 50 newtons and a force of friction of 75. Which way does air resistance act? We're not told, are we? We're told that it's pushed to the right with 200 newtons, but we're not told which way air resistance acts. Who can? Yeah, if it's moving to the right, and that's the way it's going to move because it's pushed to the right, then we can assume that air resistance is going to act to the left. We're going to draw that one to the left, and we're going to draw it about a quarter the length of, of FA. We'll call that F air, and we'll label that as 50 newtons. And we don't want to draw it approximately a quarter of the length of FA because it's 50 newtons as compared to 200. If you don't get that length perfect, that's okay. Okay, just do your best. Kind of eyeball it. You don't need to take out a ruler and measure it. Friction is 75 newtons, so it's a bit bigger than air resistance. Which way is it going to act? If it's moving to the right, Travis, friction is going to be to the left. So let's draw in the force of friction. We'll call that FF uh, is 75 newtons. By the way, you weren't told whether that was kinetic or static friction. Can you tell me whether it's kinetic or static friction now? How do you know it's kinetic friction? Yeah, yeah. Um, there's a couple things. And presumably, this is going to move because this applied force is bigger than my force of air resistance and friction combined. Okay, there is a net force acting on it. And if there's a net force, it's going to move. And if it moves, it's going to be kinetic friction. But Rutger made a good point here. He said uh, the force of friction is less than the applied force. The force of friction, if it's static friction, is always equal to your applied force. It's always equal to that until you exceed that maximum force of static friction. Then it starts moving, and you get kinetic again. Go ahead. Friction. Yep. Yep. Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah, OK. OK, uh, Rutger made a good point here. He says, um, he would have put those the other way, some of the forces the other way. He's saying that the FA is going to go this way, and it's going to be 200 newtons. He's going to put it right there because it's pushing on the object. Okay, it might be, might be, well, I guess it says, I was going to say it might be pulling on the object, but I guess it actually says it's pushing. Is that right? Okay, is what he's done there right? You know, obviously he's missing a couple forces here, but is he, is he right? Sure he's right. 
Is this right? Sure. It doesn't matter where you put them as long as you have them labeled in the proper direction and roughly the proper length. So the way we did it for, the, for FA and for FR and for FF is absolutely correct. The way that you did it, Rutger, is also absolutely correct. It doesn't make any difference in the world which way you do it. If that makes more sense to you, then do it that way. Okay? Now, are we done here? Technically, we're not. Technically, what are we missing here? Somebody tell me what we're missing here besides FA, FR, and FF. What are we missing here, Frazier? Yeah, gravity is going to act which way? Down. And it's going to be a big force. Now, because we don't actually know its value right now, um, if you don't draw it the proper length, that's okay. But we can actually figure it out fairly easily. 100 times 9.81 is 981 newtons. That's a lot bigger than 200 newtons. So it's going to act way down here. It should even be longer than, that, than I've got it drawn there. Okay, I'm not asking you to calculate that normal or the force of gravity when you draw it in there. But if you do, so much the better. We'll just label it FG. If you've actually got the value, then label it FG is equal to 981 newtons. Normal force acts up. Now, I usually draw the normal force up like this. But you could easily draw it up like this as well. Same thing. What's the value of Fn? If it's moving on a flat, horizontal surface, it's not moving up or down, then what's the value of Fn here? What's the value of Fn, Krista? 981 newtons. Now, again, if you didn't recognize that gravity was 981, you're not going to label the normal force 981 either, right? And that's okay in this question. But what you should do is recognize that Fg is the same value as Fn. Therefore, they should be drawn the same length. Okay? These guys end up canceling out. So you say, well, why do we even draw them then? To acknowledge that they're there, yes. But there will be times that we're going to encounter here through this unit where the normal force and gravity don't cancel each other out. And if we get in the habit of not drawing them in, then what's going to happen when they do matter? We're going to, we're going to start forgetting to put them in, right? When they do matter, we don't have them in there, we're in trouble. Right? So that's a free body diagram, a diagram that shows all of the forces and maybe a few other things as well, but primarily all the forces that act on an object. Now, once we have a free body diagram, solving that problem, we always take a look at that free body diagram and say the net force is equal to whatever forces don't cancel, whatever forces don't cancel each other out. Okay, gravity and the normal force canceled each other out, so we don't put those ones in here. But the force that was applied, we call that Fa. The force of air resistance, we call that F air. And the force of friction, none of those cancel each other out. So we're going to say in our next step that F net, the total force, is equal to all of those forces that haven't canceled added together. Now, if we're looking for the net force, then great, just add them up. If we're looking for the acceleration, then the next step will be to replace F net with M times A. So it becomes M A is equal to F A plus F air plus F F. Now it's simply a matter of plugging some numbers in. Okay, we had, in this case, the value of m was 100 kilograms, I think, wasn't it? Yeah, 100 kilograms. We don't know what the acceleration is. Presumably, that's what we're trying to find. Fa, in that example, was 200 newtons. And it was to the right, so we're going to make it positive. F air, the force of air resistance, was 50 newtons to the left. So we're going to make that negative. Same thing as subtracting. Right? Force of friction was 75 to the left. We'll make that negative as well. So 200 plus neg 50 plus neg 75 gives me on the right-hand side 125. If we were just looking for the net force, we're done. It's 125. But if we're looking for the acceleration, we're going to divide that by 100. gives me 1.25 meters per second squared. Is that ringing a bell from Friday here? Made a mistake here, guys. 200 plus negative 50 plus negative 75 
This gives me 125, right? So that gives me, it should give me 75, right? Thank you, Frazier. Um, so 75 newtons would be the net force, not 125. And 75 divided by 100 gives me the acceleration to 0 0.75 meters per second squared. So the method is correct. It's just the simple addition was incorrect there. Okay. You had two questions for homework. They were page 150, questions 1 and 1 question for homework. Page 150, number 1, I guess it was. We're going to go through this question, whether you need to go over it or not. Okay, so I'm not even going to ask for a show of hands. This one says, in the men's four-man bobsled event in the Winter Olympics, the maximum mass of a bobsled with two riders, a pilot, and a brake man is 630 kilograms. During the practice run, riders A and B exert average forces of 1220 newtons and 1200 newtons forward, respectively, to accelerate the bobsled to, of, of mass 255 kilograms, a pilot of mass 98, and a brake man of mass 97 kilograms. Then they jump in for the challenging ride down the 1300 meter course. Uh, during, the cor during the pushing, the magnitude of the force of friction is 430 newtons. We want to find the average acceleration of the bobsled, uh, the bobsled, the pilot, and the brake man. So we have in this question uh, a bobsled that we're going to simplify just as a box. And the bobsled um, experiences a couple of forces acting on it, a few forces acting on it here. Riders A and B exert average forces of 1220 and 1200 newtons respectively. So we're going to say, we'll call this FA. We're going to make that 1220. And we'll make this one FB. It's slightly smaller. It's 1,200 newtons. It also tells us that there's a force of friction acting on 430 newtons. Which way does friction act? To the right or to the left? Which way is it going to move here? If these guys are pushing it to the right, it isn't going to all of a sudden start moving to the left. It's going to move to the right, therefore friction is going to act to the left. It's a small value, 430 newtons. Right there. Now what's the mass here? This gets a little bit confusing, because they tell me in this question, the maximum mass of a bobsled with two riders, a pilot, and a brake man is 630 newtons. But in this practice run, we've only got two riders. We've got rider A and rider B. The bobsled has a mass of 255 kilograms. We've got rider A that's 98 kilograms, and rider B that's 97 kilograms. And it doesn't look like there's anybody else on this bobsled right now. There's just the, the pilot and the brake man. So let's get the total mass here. 255 plus 98 plus 97 is going to give me, I believe, 350. 450 kilograms, yes, thank you. 450 kilograms that wasn't a mistake. That was just a test, right, to see if you catch that. 450 kilograms is our total mass. Now, we want to find the acceleration. We've got our free body diagram drawn. By the way, there's something that's missing on this free body diagram. What is it? What's, what's missing on this free body diagram here? Yeah, they cancel each other out. So it's not a huge deal, but we should draw them in just so that we don't forget when it actually matters. Okay? All right. So we've got our free body diagram drawn. Our next step is to say the net force is equal to all of the forces that haven't canceled. Those forces include FF plus FA plus FB. Hey, the first one I drew was FA. Shouldn't I put that one first here? What's 1 plus 2? Okay, 3, obviously. What's 2 plus 1? 3. Does it matter what order I add things in? So FF plus FA plus FB is the same thing as saying FA plus FB plus FF. It doesn't matter what order you put them in. We get the same answer. F net is also equal to M times A. Now we start plugging our numbers in here. The mass is 450 kilograms. 
times the acceleration, which is what we're looking for in this question. FF is 430 plus 1220 plus 1200 newtons. Is that right? Is that okay? Yeah? Better? Good. 430 should be negative. How come? Good. It's going in the opposite direction. Now, in this question, it didn't actually say right, left. Right? It didn't say that these guys are pushing to the right. It depends on our frame of reference. If you had made those applied forces, FA and FB, to the left, then friction would have been to the right. A and B would have been negative forces, and friction would have been a positive value, right? Okay, it's not a big deal. If you had it drawn it that way, you would have just gotten an acceleration that was a negative value instead of a positive value because it was accelerating to the left instead of to the right. Doesn't matter. Okay, let's say 450 times A. Uh, let's add these up. 430 plus 1220 plus uh, 1200. What do we get when we add those three things up? 199? 1990. Thank you. Which now we're going to divide by 450. Going to give you somewhere in the range of 4.5, I'm thinking. Oh, it's, yeah, I guess the answer's right there, 4.4 .4 meters per second squared. Is that okay? How many people got that? How many people messed up on the mass? Put 630 in there for the mass. Hey, man, that is an easy thing to do, okay? If you made that mistake, um, you've got to be careful and read the question really carefully, but it's still a really, really easy mistake to make, okay? Um, honestly, if I was in grade 11 right now and doing this for the first time, I'm not sure whether I would have gotten this question right or not. I may very well have put 630 in there, just like some of you guys did. Good? We're going to give you a few questions to work on for homework, but I'm going to give you a bit of a head start here right now and let you work on them for a few minutes in class here. Page 136, number 1 to 4 and 8. Um, while you're working on this, keep in mind question number 1 what SI means. Anybody tell me what that stands for? SI? Yeah. It's French for international. Yes. Yes. System International. It's French for the International System of Measurement, which is which system? The metric system. Right. So basically, uh, question number 1A, we're looking for definition of force. And we're looking for the metric unit of force, which is always, of course, the units that we use. We know that that's going to be a, a Newton, right? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. We're going to move forward here now, guys, to the third of the three laws that we talk about in this unit involving forces. This one's called Newton's third law. Original names say Newton's first law, Newton's second law, and Newton's third law. Um, Newton's first law said an object at rest wants to stay at rest forever and ever and ever until acted upon by an unbalanced force. An object in motion wants to stay in motion forever in a straight line at a constant speed until acted upon by an unbalanced force. The second law says the acceleration is directly proportional to the force, the net force, and inversely proportional to the mass. In other words, bigger force, bigger acceleration, bigger mass, smaller acceleration. Does anybody know the third law? You've seen this before at some point. Can anybody tell me what that third law is? Yeah. Good. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Now, that's probably the exact words that you learned in grade 6 or grade 7 or whatever it was that you learned Newton's third law. And it is absolutely correct. Okay, there's nothing wrong with the, the words that you gave me there. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. But that's not the way that I'm going to tell you Newton's third law. I don't like that definition. Okay, I don't like the way that that's phrased, even though that's the way probably every single one of you learned it. I don't like it because it can lead to a misconception. It's not wrong, but it can lead to a misconception in our mind here. We've got two cars hitting each other right now here. Car number five and car number inverted five, reverse five. You caught me. I just cheated and flipped, flipped one of them over. I want to draw a free body diagram. I want you, I want somebody, one of you guys, to draw a free body diagram of this car, car number five, when it gets hit by the other one. Okay? In fact, just to simplify it a little bit, 
I'm going to get rid of this car. It's gone. Okay. I want you to draw a free body diagram on this car when the other car, inverted five, hits it. Anybody want to do that, please? All right, thank you for volunteering, Eric. Eric's going to come up and draw at least one force that's acting on this car as a result of the collision with the other car. If you want to draw more than one force, go ahead. But I'm only going to make you draw one before I seek more volunteers for this. I'll see. Eric's got the easy one here. What did he pick? You picked the force of gravity, right? Thank you, Eric. You're good to go. Thank you. Now, the force of gravity isn't 9.81. He's labeled it wrong, but it is acting down. Force of gravity is actually m times 9.81. Right? Who's next? Oh, come on. Take the next one, because the next one's easy. Take the next one before I call on you, when you have to do the hard one. Thank you. Travis is a smart one. Eh? He knows what he knows the next one is easy. Can't hold on to a pen, but I have that problem too. That's the normal force, right? Now, technically his normal force should be drawn a little bit shorter because we want to have that normal force drawn about the same length as the force of gravity. Although we're not going to lose too much sleep over that. Okay, those two forces end up canceling each other out, but it's still a good idea to draw them. Because they don't always cancel each other. We haven't done a situation where they don't cancel yet, but we will. So we should draw them in anyways. Who's up for the next one? Thank you, Devin, for volunteering. Oh, I have no idea. Come on up and draw another force that acts on car five as a result of that collision. Uh, not a force of friction. Yeah, I call it FA, the, for, the applied force. Sure. Is she right? The other car, car reverse 5, applies a force on car 5. We'll call that FA. That's correct. We've got a force acting on car 5 as a result of the other car. We're calling that FA. That force is opposing its motion. Right, you hit another car, that force of the other car opposes your motion. A lot more than friction does, right? You've got a force that's slowing you down, and again, we're calling that F.A. Who's up next? Any other forces? Remember Newton's third law. What did Newton's third law say? Lane? <coughs> For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Equal and opposite Reaction. Now, could somebody come up and draw another force, if there is another force? Yes? All right. Rutger's going to add it here and see if we can get this right here. Oh, he's got a force that's he's drawn to the right. We're going to call that F. Okay. He's calling that F. Okay, FR for reaction, force of the action force, the, the uh, force of reaction. Is that right, guys? Good? How many people say that's right? How many people say that this free body diagram is good now? How many people say that it's not good? Oh, oh okay, wait, we got, we got four people, I think, said that it's not good. Why isn't it good? What's wrong with it? Okay, so the, there's probably friction here as well. Let's pretend this is on ice. For whatever reason, these cars are, maybe that's why they hit each other, because they're, they're on ice. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, perfect. So if we ignore friction, is this complete now? No? How many people say that it is complete if we ignore friction? Okay, how many people say it isn't complete? Okay, Fraser, what's wrong? Okay, let's ignore air resistance too. We're on ice and we're in a vacuum. And that's why, again, that's why these cars crash. Think about it, guys. You're driving on ice and you can't breathe because there's no air. You're probably going to crash your car. So that's, that's why these two cars crashed. There's no ice, there's no friction, there's no air resistance. Frazier is complete now. 
He's still going to say no because he's figuring I'm asking the question because it's not complete. There is something wrong with this. There is something wrong with this diagram. Okay, in this diagram, the way that we have it drawn, clearly FG and FN cancel out, and that's correct. They do cancel out as long as we're on that flat horizontal surface and the car isn't going up or going down. But let's take a look at the action force and the reaction force. They're equal and opposite, so they should cancel, right? Well, if this car is moving and all of the forces cancel, then what's going to happen to it? It's going to keep moving in a straight line at a constant speed forever. In other words, according to this analysis, nothing will ever stop. Because when it hits something, there's going to be an equal and opposite reaction force, which is going to balance with the action force, which means the forces are always going to balance out. But we know that things stop. We know that when you hit something, you stop. So what's wrong with this? I already said that Devin was right. The action force on that car. What's wrong with it? It's the reaction force. It is absolutely an equal and opposite reaction force. But the equal and opposite reaction force acts on the other car. You can see now that we still have equal and opposite forces, but because they're acting on two different objects, it means that the forces don't cancel. Does that make sense? Now this car, this car number five, normal force and gravity cancel out, but that applied force on it, the, the action force caused by the second reverse five car, provides a net force on that car, which means it's going to slow down and stop. That's why I don't like the way that most people learn Newton's third law. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Because it leads to this conclusion. It leads to the conclusion that the forces are always going to balance and the car is going to keep moving forever, which clearly doesn't happen. So here's the way I state Newton's third law. Here's the way I state it. I'll give you a chance to write this down in a second here. Don't worry about that right now. Just listen right now. I state it in the following way. If object A applies a force on object B, then object B applies an equal and opposite force on object A. Okay, if object A applies a force on object B, object B applies an equal and opposite force on object A. It's the same thing as Lane said. Okay, it's the exact same definition, except that it, it, it's, it's the two objects are in your face, object A and object B. There's no forgetting that we're dealing with two separate objects. If we state it the first way, a reaction, there's an equal and opposite reaction, then it's easy to forget there's two objects. There's always two objects involved here. Does that make sense? All right, let's take a look at some action and reaction forces here. Let's say I give you a push. What's the action force? Pushing on you, right? What's the reaction force? You push back on me, right? I push on you, you push on me. You get up in the middle of the night, everybody's had to do this at some point, right? You get up in the middle of the night, you gotta go pee. Okay, it's dark, you can't see. You stub your toe on the end of the bed. Why does your toe hurt? Not because you, not because you hit the, uh, the foot of the bed with your toe, why does your toe hurt? Because the foot of the bed hit your toe back. You kicked the bed, the bed kicked you back. That's why your toe hurts. It doesn't hurt to kick anything. It hurts when you get kicked. The bed kicked you back. You ever get in a fight? Don't do this, by the way. Don't get in a fight at school. You ever do? And let's say it's your fault. Okay, it's completely your fault. You punch somebody in the face for no reason. Don't do that. You punch somebody in the face, which you're not going to ever do. You go to Mr. Stafficek's office, which you're not going to ever do because you're all good. And Mr. Stafficek says, what do you think you're doing? You can't just go up and hit people. And your defense is, well, like, I hit him, but he hit me too. What do you mean? He didn't hit you back. Yes, he did. When I punched his face, his face, his face, his face punched my face back. 
at the exact same time. If object A applies, you can even quote Newton's third law. Mrs. Staffordchuk, if object A applies a force on object B, object B applies an equal and opposite force on object A. I'm not sure how far that'll go in your defense, but it's true. That's right, he had butt your fist, that's right. Newton's third law, now you can write it down. Newton's third law, if object A applies a force on object B, object B applies an equal and opposite force on object A. So here's my next question. If object A applies a force on object B, and object B always applies an equal and opposite force on object A, how do we explain broken glass? If I punch the glass and it breaks, or I throw a rock at the glass and it breaks, how can we say that there's equal and opposite forces acting there? The rock applies a force on the window, clearly, if the window breaks. But how can we say that the window applies an equal and opposite force on the rock if the rock just keeps going through the window? Right? The window broke, the rock didn't. The window fell to the ground as it broke, the rock just kept going. Slowed down a little bit, but keep going. Does Newton's third law only apply when things don't break? Newton's third law always applies. So how do we... How do we explain that? How do we reconcile that? The fact that this window, this glass breaks, the rock that broke it, or my hand that broke it, kept going, but yet experienced the same equal and opposite force? Frazier, was your hand up a second ago? Uh, no, it was, but change your mind? Yeah. All right. Because the rock has more potential energy than the window, you understand? The rock will require you're close. You're close. You're close. But let's not use potential energy. Let's not use that word. We haven't even learned potential energy yet. We will later on, but we haven't learned it yet. Okay? Let's look at force. Yeah? Yep. Good. Good. But what happens? As it reaches that maximum capability, it's a good answer. Okay? Said the window has reached or the rock applies the maximum capability, for lack of a better term, okay, that the window can handle. Okay, let's say the window will break at 50 newtons. Okay, you, apply, you throw a rock at the window. What force does the rock apply on the window? Well, it can't apply more than 50 because the window breaks at 50, right? So how much force did the, window, did the rock apply on the window? 50 newtons. The window broke. How much force did the window apply on the rock? 50 newtons. Well, why didn't the rock break? It's a simple answer, guys. Why didn't the rock break? Yeah? The rock is stronger. It's harder and stronger than the window. 50 newtons is enough to break a window. 50 newtons is applied back on the rock. It's just not enough to break the rock. Why did the rock keep going? If 50 newtons was applied on the rock, why did it keep going through the window? Because 50 newtons wasn't even enough to stop the rock. Still applied on the rock. It slowed down the rock. 50 newtons was enough to break the window. It was only enough to slow down the rock. Does that make sense? If object A applies a force on object B, object B always, every single time, no matter what, applies an equal and opposite force on object A. Now, we got a question here that is going to... Um, take us a little bit further uh, from what we were working on earlier today with the whole free body diagrams and forces and so on. And it's going to take us into requiring Newton's third law to finish off the question. So we're going to solve this question real similar to what we have been doing, but then we're going to use Newton's third law to kind of finish off this question. This question says we've got three boxes, A, B, and C. We've got an applied force acting on A, causing all of the boxes to accelerate at 1.5 meters per second squared. We want to find the force exerted by C on B. We want to find this force right here. Is there a force of C on B? Does C push on B? I'm pushing this thing to the right. You can see the person's hand there, right? Pushing it to the right. Does C push on B? It has to. Why? Well, because in order for C to go forward, B has to push it forward. 
Right? When I push on A, it pushes B, B pushes on C. If B pushes on C, then C must push back with an equal and opposite force on B. Does that make sense? All right. So we're going to get the force of B on C, or the force of C on B. It doesn't really matter because they're equal and opposite. How are we going to do that? Well, we're going to pick one of these objects to analyze. Let's pick object C to analyze. It's like, it's like analyzing a semi-truck and using the trailer only, not the, not the truck part of it. Okay, object C has a mass of 5 kilograms. It's a frictionless surface. There's no force of friction acting back on it. There is a force of B acting on C. Right? B has to push on C. There is a force of gravity acting down on C and a normal force acting up, but they cancel. There's an applied force right here, but that's not, act not acting directly on object C. Right? It's, like, it's like the semi-truck that's loaded with stuff. Okay, when, I was, when I was a kid, like a little kid, um, I, lived, I grew up on the East Coast, and uh, an uncle of mine drove a, a, a semi-truck for a, an ice cream company in Ontario. And every once in a while, a couple times a year, he would make this trip out to the East Coast um, with ice cream. Okay? So um, when he came out to the East Coast, he would always drive out with, uh, he'd always have this semi-truck full of ice cream, and he'd always uh, stop and spend one night at my grandfather's house. Okay? He'd sleep there for one night. And we always went out to visit him when he was, when he was uh, at my grandfather's house for the night. And I remember this one time that he came. This was the, oh, let me tell you, this was the greatest thing that could ever happen to a kid. I went out there one night, and he had discovered that, uh, that, uh, that part of his, the load had shifted when he was, when he was somewhere between Toronto and uh, Nova Scotia. Part of the load had shifted and fallen off of these pallets. So what happened? Well, it, it dented. Uh, a lot of the, some of the containers of ice cream, a lot of containers of ice cream, ice cream sandwiches and ice cream, whatever. And when he phoned uh, his boss, basically, in Toronto and said, well, what do I do with this? Like, I've got all this ice cream that's got dented packaging. And they're like, well, we can't sell it, so just leave it. So here we are, me and my brother, who's three years older than I was. We're at my grandfather's house, and my uncle says, you know what? We've got all this ice cream in the back of this truck that we can't sell because it's got dented packaging. Um, we have to leave it somewhere. Uh, it's the greatest thing in the world to be like a five-year-old kid and to realize you've just gotten a pallet of ice cream. Ice cream sandwiches and drumsticks and every, everything else. We ate ice cream. Like, we ate ice cream to no end for the next few months because, uh, because it had dented packaging. It was great. Um, you're in a semi-truck here, guys. <clears throat> You've got, you've got stuff in the back of a semi-truck, okay, whether it's ice cream or, or, or something else. Okay? Okay. Each of those objects in the back of the semi-truck will accelerate at the same rate as the semi-truck is, is, is moving. We can analyze individual objects inside that semi-truck, or we can analyze the semi-truck itself. What we've done until now is analyze the semi-truck itself, right? the entire object the one object, right, the semi-truck. But now what we're doing when we're analyzing object C is picking one of the boxes of ice cream inside the semi-truck to analyze. We're analyzing part of it, not the whole thing. Does that make sense? Okay. Does the box of ice cream inside the semi-truck have forces acting on it? Sure it does. So let's analyze that box of ice cream or that one box, object C, within the semi-truck. Okay. There's three forces acting on it. There's the force of B on C, because this box of ice cream has to push on this box of ice cream in order to move it. There's gravity and normal force, which cancel. This applied force is not acting directly on C. That's acting on the big semi-truck, okay, the semi-truck itself. The force between the wheels and the ground, they're acting on the semi-truck. They're not acting directly on that box of ice cream. There's only these three forces that act on this box of ice cream, or whatever it is, and two of them cancel. 
So let's analyze the object now, object C. We say F net is equal to the sum of the forces that don't cancel. Gravity and normal force cancel. The only thing I'm left with is FBC. Next step is M times A is equal to FBC. What mass do I use? 8, 10, 5, or 23? If you're analyzing the box of ice cream in the back of that semi-truck, you don't want to use the mass of the semi-truck, do you? You want to use the mass of the box of ice cream. So the mass that we're going to use here is 5 kilograms. The mass of the box that I'm analyzing, the mass of box C. Now, all three boxes, or we can consider this to be our semi-truck, are starting at 1.5. If the semi-truck accelerates at 1.5, what's the rate of acceleration of one of the boxes of ice cream inside the semi-truck? I'll give you a hint. Don't make this harder than it has to be. If the semi-truck accelerates at 1.5, what's the acceleration of each and every box of ice cream inside the semi-truck? 1.5. So if the system, all three boxes, are accelerating at 1.5, then box C obviously must be accelerating at 1.5 as well. Look at that, we can solve for FBC. 5 times 1.5 is 7.5. FBC equals 7.5 Newtons. Now, here's where Newton's third law comes in. That's not what I was looking for. I wasn't looking for the force of B on C. I was looking for the force of C on B. If the force of B on C is 7.5 newtons, what's the force of C on B? Right? Negative 7.5. So let's say that FCB is negative 7.5 newtons, or 7.5 to the left. Is that okay? Some of you, when you were looking at that, might have said, kind of in the back of your mind, maybe, well, why couldn't we have analyzed object B? We could have. Here's the problem with that, though. Object B has a force of A acting on it. Object B has a force of C acting on it. Also has gravity and the normal force, but they cancel. If we analyze object B, we have two forces that we don't know the value of. That's two unknowns in the same equation, which doesn't work for us. So I picked the easier object, object C, where there was only one force acting on it. Does that make sense? So here's the rule of thumb. When you're solving these problems and you want to find, we call it an internal force, the force of one box of ice cream acting on another, not the forces acting on the semi-truck, but the forces between the boxes of ice cream inside the semi-truck. When you want to find an internal force, then analyze one of the objects, not the whole thing. You got that? If we wanted to find an internal force between atoms in your body, we'd analyze one of the atoms in your body, not your whole body. If we want to find the force of the trailer on the tractor for the semi-truck, then we'd analyze either the tractor or the trailer not the whole semi-truck. Okay, if we want to analyze the force on um, the force on you on the back of your on, on your back as you're sitting in the car and the car accelerates forward, we're going to analyze you, not the car and you together. Okay, you want to find an internal force, analyze one of the objects, not the whole thing. Okay, let's see what you can do with uh, practice problems on page 164, please. Okay, we're only doing question number one here. We're only going to do question number one. And it requires this picture, this picture that we have in, uh, no, it doesn't. Uh, is that 3.12? Yeah. It requires this picture that we have here in our previous example. But we're not trying to find this time the force of C on B. In question number one, we're trying to find the force that B exerts on A. So what are you going to do? You're going you're to analyze one object, right? But it's not going to be C. 
If you want to find the force of A on B, you're going to analyze either A or B. Which one, which one to you looks the simplest? Pick one. If it doesn't work for you, try the other one. If you analyze A and it doesn't work, try B. If you analyze B and it doesn't work, try A. Because the force between them is the same, just opposite direction. So again, you're doing only question number one. Don't worry about question number two. Use the information that we got in the example to solve for the force of B acting on A. Let's take a look at it here now. I know that some people are struggling a little bit with it. Some people are, are well on their way here. Um, we have to pick either object A or object B and draw a free body diagram for one of those two. Let's pick A first. Okay? Let's say we have, we have no idea. We have no idea which one to do, so let's pick A. Let's draw the free body diagram for object A. There is gravity and the normal force acting on object A. They cancel. All right? We also have the applied force. It's this guy's hand applying on object A. We don't know what its value is. We're just going to call that F. A. And we also have the force of B acting on A. It's pushing back this way. We don't know what its value is either. We could set this up as a net force is equal to the sum of the forces problem. And then we could replace F net with M times A, as we always do. We know what the value of M is. A, M is 8 kilograms. We know what the value of A is. The acceleration is going to still be 1.5 meters per second squared, right? If one box of ice cream is 1.5, then all of the boxes of ice cream are 1.5. We don't know what FA is. We don't know what FBA is. We get two unknowns. That didn't work for me. So I picked object A. I tried. I had two unknowns. Now it didn't work, so I got to pick object B. Let's erase that. And let's draw the free body diagram now for, for object B. Here's object B. B is a mass of 10 kilograms. Object B has a force of A acting on it. We'll call that FAB, force of A acting on B. Object B, as Bailey was telling me here just a minute ago, object B also has a force of C acting on it. We'll call that FCB. Gravity acts down, normal force acts up, they cancel. The value of FCB is negative 7.5 newtons. We know it because we've already found it. Now let's set this up as a net force problem. FAB plus FCB. Let's replace F net with M times A. M is 10 kilograms, A is 1.5. Hold on two seconds. Don't pack up. Don't leave yet here. Uh, A is 1.5. FAB is what we're looking for. FCB is negative 7.5. 10 times 1.5 is, is uh, 15. Take the 7. Don't pack up yet, please. We're not done yet. Take the 7.5 over by adding. FAB ends up being equal to 22.5 or 23 newtons. So the force of A acting on B is 23 newtons. We're actually looking for the force of B acting on A though, right? So what's that going to be? It's going to be negative 23 newtons. Does that make sense? All right, your homework. Your homework for tonight. The practice problems that we've already given you, sorry, the check and reflect questions that we've already given you on page, uh, it was page, uh, 136, and I also want you to do the following questions on page 164. Questions 1, 2, 3, 4. Let's go, uh, let's go, let's go 1 to 7. Okay. So you've got page 136, number 1 to 4 and 8, and you've got 164, number 1 to 7. I'm sorry? 168, sorry, yes it is, 168, number 1 to 7. Have a good night, everyone.